Good afternoon, very good morning, evening, depending on which part of the world you're located at. And welcome to the third panel of the In Conversation with Clicks that we are organizing today under the theme measuring the impact of emergency online teaching on the quality of education. My name is Neriman Hashhamu, and I'm the founder and the CEO of the Center for Learning Innovations and Customized Knowledge Solutions. And for we're we're really we're delighted to have uh, you all with us today. We're expecting many more colleagues to join us very shortly. Um, I will very in in a bit hand over to the chair of our panel today, Professor Ghassan Awad, a dear and esteemed colleague and friend uh, of, of of mine and of the center as a whole. He's the president at the of the Applied Science University in Bahrain, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, having him as the chair of the panel today. Uh, for those of you who are attending um, with us for the, the, the uh, who are attending with us for the very first time, the aim of launching this series of panel discussion is really to provide in-depth discussions and insights about planning the higher, uh, the future of higher education uh, in light of the pandemic and the COVID. So it's really about capitalizing on uh, lessons learned, capitalizing on practices that are happening uh, nationally, regionally, and globally. We hope that we. Pro through, through this panel, we can provide a, a, a platform where we can share experiences and we can share views. Uh, we will be running our last panel for this academic year next week, next uh, on the 13th of July, next Monday. Uh, and we will be addressing a very interesting topic around uh, non-degree credentials uh, post the pandemic and how should the higher education sector adapt to the new modern workforce. So we'll talk a lot about micro-credential and micro-degrees and so forth. So I hope to see you also uh, next Monday, same time uh, for the last panel of this season. And then we will be back again in September with a new series of panel. But in the meantime, uh, please feel free to visit our website to know more about our activities. We have other things happening other than the panel. Now, we're expecting to have more than uh, 200 colleagues from um, uh, more than 50 countries. Uh, obviously, you know, we hope that everybody is able to be with us today. Uh, may I also remind uh, participants that throughout the session, they can interact with the panel with the panelists through the questions and answer uh, box. Please do not use the chat for the questions because we will not be able to address the questions in the chat box. Um, if you can keep kindly your questions concise and short, if you wish to address the question to a specific panelist, please mention that the question is for a specific panelist. Now, without further ado, I would like to finally thank uh, our uh, sponsors for this series of panel discussion, AUF Moyen-Orient, who are our sil silver sponsor. And before hand handing over to Professor Rassan, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Hervé Sabourin, uh, Director General or the Director General of the agency uh, of the Moyen-Orient AUF agency for a few, to say a few words. Uh, Mr. Sabourin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nariman. So, dear, dear colleagues, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everyone. I, as regional director of the AUF Finalist Office, I am very pleased to open this third virtual panel series organized by CLICS, Center for Learning, Innovation and Customized Knowledge Solutions, and sponsored by AUF, Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie. The aim of that panel is to share opinions and visions about the challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis. The period that we are facing nowadays, and that we'll probably face during the next months, has deeply impacted all university systems. We can no longer teach as before. We can no longer manage institutions as before, and we need to shape research activities, strategies, and targets in the light of that particular situation. Digital technologies, online teaching and working, have been implemented worldwide, requiring, requiring at the same time new skills and new competencies for staff, for teachers, and for students. Many challenges are now in front of us with a key question, how to take advantage of that period in order to find sustainable solutions for ensuring the continuity of university missions. 
your opinion and proposition, propositions will be definitely very helpful. For many years, AUF has been strongly committed to supporting its member institutions in the necessary transition to new visions and new practices, and how to enhance the capacity of learners to access, to assess, to adopt, and to apply knowledge using mainly distance learning and digital technologies. That commitment makes all the more sense today, and that's why our agency is so pleased to take part in that, in that new clicks initiative bringing the experience and expertise of its network of around 1,000 higher education institutions in 118 countries spread over all continents. My warm thanks to CLICS, to its CEO, Dr. Nariman Hajhamu, and all her team for our very efficient collaboration. Thanks a lot to all participants for sharing a part of that time with us. Thanks to all panelists. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sabuha. And now without further ado, I will hand over to Professor Ghassan uh, Awad, our chair for today's panel. Professor Ghassan. Uh, hello, good afternoon from Bahrain, the Kingdom of Bahrain. Good evening, good morning, good day. Thank you, Clix, for connecting the world. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nariman, for your vision and leadership. I know how dedicated and you are an asset to the higher education sector globally. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted. My name is Ghassan Awad. I'm president of Applied Science University in Bahrain. And uh, we will be covering in our panel, uh, measuring the impact of emergency online teaching on the quality of education. It's interesting, it wasn't online, it was emergency online teaching because it happened so sudden for all of us. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be chairing this panel. Uh, we have uh, assembled, uh, I think, uh, esteemed colleagues from across the globe. I would call them the cream of the cream. Uh, believe me, they are so knowledgeable. They have plenty of, of expertise and experiences and uh, they will share it with us uh, uh, today. Uh, many thanks to all the participants, uh, wherever you are. Uh, and uh, uh, the panelists uh, for uh, this session, uh, Mr. Douglas Blackstock, uh, the Chief Executive of the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education, the QA in the UK. Uh, the second speaker will be Dr. Susanna Karakanyan, President of the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, INQUARTI, and Division Director in Abu Dhabi, Department of Education and Knowledge, ADEC, UAE. We have from the Philippines, Professor Melinda Bandalaria, who is the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Open University. And from the United States, we have Dr. Debra Adair, Executive Director of Quality Matters. So you can see that we have a fantastic panel from across the globe, uh, different time zones, uh, but we're delighted to be, to be here and I'm hoping that you will enjoy uh, the panel discussion. The speakers will speak only for five to six minutes and we will give the audience plenty of time uh, to ask questions. Uh, uh, I would like to thank Elena for running the presentation in the background. Elena, please, if you can put the first slide. <coughs> If you put it on, is it, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've already done the presentation that I presented the panels. Uh, now, please, if I can look at the purpose, if you can go back, please. <clears throat> the, the purpose of the panel discussion, just straightforward, uh, to hear views from experienced colleagues about the impact of emergency online teaching on quality of education, to share good practices or maybe bad practices even, and to engage with the audience through the question and answer and voting session. You will be voting at some stage, which will be really, really interesting. Next slide, please, Elena. Uh, I want to show here the, the, the John Cotter change management model. 
يعني some uh, maybe uh, month back nobody could imagine that uh, online teaching would become the norm for all maybe universities and schools across the globe and uh, the stage one in the cotter change management model is establish the sense of urgency which for some reason has disappeared from the screen but stage one is establish the sense of urgency so you can see why everybody is just trying their best to work together in a coalition to ensure that our students are completing their degree, their studies, and graduating from our universities. So this was the best application, I think, for the John Cotter model. I've used it for 20 years. I couldn't feel the time is right now to look at this model again and understand the sense of urgency in that model. Next one, please, uh, Elena. At uh, uh, Applied Science University in Bahrain, at, in Bahrain, the Kingdom of Bahrain, I think we have been very fortunate in, in running uh, our uh, online teaching and assessment uh, through guidelines from a various body of the Higher Education Council, the Bahrain Quality Assurance Authority, the Ministry of Education, and so on. And in our case, we have just looked at the different types of, of, of teaching models, the traditional classroom teaching, uh, the blended teaching and learning and the online distance teaching and learning. And you can see in every model, uh, the plus and minuses. Uh, if you look at the uh, traditional classroom teaching and learning, of course, the full campus experience, which is in the online uh, teaching model, our, our students will be deprived of the real uh, on-campus experience. Uh, but that, that's fine. They are, they are living now the virtual campus experience, uh, another way. Uh, and if you look at the, the environment, we are saving money by running our courses online. Uh, no carbon footprint in a traditional way uh, you have more carbon footprints of course uh, you rely on uh, uh, physical presence in the traditional mode while you rely on technology and instructors in, in the distant learning mode. so you can see uh, uh, there are differences between all three models uh, they have advantages and disadvantages uh, of course uh, assessment will remain the biggest challenge i think students evaluation uh, because in the traditional way the students are present in the university, the uh, uh, authentic assessment is fully guaranteed, uh, while in the online teaching model, maybe uh, uh, authentic assessment is not guaranteed. Of course, there are some technologies being developed now based on image and speech recognition to help maybe in, in proctoring and, and delivering the, the, the online evaluation in a better way. Uh, next one, please, uh, Elena. <clears throat> Uh, this is just a, a learning scenario model. Imagine in our case now, because of the online uh, approach, we have uh, become technology brave. Some of us may have been technology shy in the past, and we are using a different lifestyle. It has to be an inspirational lifestyle because you are teaching from a distance. So in that model, when you have technology online and you are using an inspiration leadership style, you will see a lot of innovation, Learning become more exciting, it's a project based, a lot of research, an engaging type of model with the learners. And it's a learning centered approach, more than the traditional approach where in the past we have relied on the, we have been shy, I think, about the use of technology. We have used to a large extent the autocratic leadership style, dictating to our students, broadcasting to them. Uh, uh, the traditional way it doesn't work any, anyway. It has to be an engaging model. So the online, uh, teaching and assessment has proven to be really exciting for our students in Bahrain. They, they really love it that uh, they are learning online, they are involving projects, they are doing presentation. So the extra skills uh, they are gaining, it just helped them immensely in terms of students. Improvement. Next slide, please, Elena. Now, this is just a framework which our colleague will, will cover, the panelists will cover in their presentations, maybe. Uh, but in terms of online teaching and learning and assessment, uh, and what's needed, and the quality should be at the heart of all what we do. Quality is the oxygen we breathe every day. It has to be part of our value system. And it involves so many aspects. So from capacity creation for staff, for students, for alumni, for external stakeholders, to the infrastructure you need, the IT, uh, to the policies and strategies. The university has to have an online strategy now, has policies to deal with. You need the bylaws to, to govern your uh, online aspect, benchmarking to see what's happening across the globe in terms of online teaching and assessment. And today, this is a good opportunity for us to learn from experiences from five countries, in fact, and share our, our, our experiences. You need to keep researching because technology is moving fast and the online 
uh, teaching approach is becoming more mature to a large extent in such a collaboration. Thank you, Clix. You can see this is just a good example of how we brought the world together today. Uh, support from the governing body in my own university, the support from the chair of the Board of Trustees, Professor Wayne Khalil, is vital for us in order to be able to deliver uh, the online teaching and assessment. And of course, the regulations, the regulatory bodies, they have their own rules and their own regulations. And uh, when we have to respect them and listen to them, and we'll be very, very lucky in Bahrain that we are receiving them on an almost weekly basis with some uh, guidance of how to deal with, uh, with uh, open uh, uh, and online uh, teaching and learning. Next one, uh, have I finished? Okay, so this will conclude my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question. I think uh, there's a time for voting now. Elena, is that correct? So for us, uh, what's uh, uh, the question for the audience now, please? Uh, I want to see more people. Uh, what's the most important factor that can affect the quality of online education? Is it the national regulation, the institution strategies and policies, the ICT infrastructure, and the faculty readiness and the students' assessment? And uh, if you could vote, please. <clears throat> We'll give them a little bit more time, uh, Elena, to see how many they will vote. Okay, audience, please keep voting. Very, uh, very close uh, uh, results, in fact. Uh, now, who's the winner? Wow, well, it's the ICT infrastructure. I, I run, by the way, the same uh, poll in my own university to all staff in the university. We had about maybe 100, I think, staff and the institution strategies and policies were the winner. Here, the ICT infrastructure is important, uh, of course, but I think all other aspects are as important, of course. The regulations are important and the strategies and the readiness of the faculty and the admin staff as well. And the student's assessment, which we can say as, as a challenge uh, for all of us. Uh, okay, now, Elena, and uh, next, the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Douglas Blackstock, please, uh, Mr. Douglas, uh, five to six minutes, and then we'll have your uh, questions for polling, then we move to the next uh, speaker. Okay, Mr. Douglas. Thank you, Hassan, and uh, I hope that Elena can keep in time with me with my slides, because I might speak quite quickly. But as chair, please slow me down, because this Glasgow accent is, uh, I know, challenging for some colleagues. It, Hassan, and uh, Herv and Nariman, we were last in the same room in the beginning of March in Dubai. And I had been in Abuja, Nigeria, at an association of African universities and World Bank conference talking about accreditation um, and the accreditation service that QA runs. And, and I got a call from Nariman saying, are you still coming? The airports are starting to be closed and Flights have been, uh, been cancelled, uh, uh, but we got to meet a very good conference in Dubai, and it feels like a lifetime ago. I, I mean, really, in three months, the world of higher education, our whole world, has been turned on its head, uh, and, but we've been able to adapt rapidly. I was thinking, in that world of that beautiful conference in Dubai, I had just managed to have a nice side conversation with my friend Nadim Khan from the higher colleges of technology who had just gone through the QA accreditation and we we're looking forward to building partnerships and making return visits and I think it might be a little while before we fly anywhere and that is just one of the big things that institutions have had to think about is their international students but as QA I want to just give you a macro overview of the type of things that we've been thinking about and working on and certainly on the emergency remote teaching and the shift for the sector to online teaching and assessment. We've been working on producing guidance to support 
at the sector. But we haven't experienced, of course, in higher education for a very long time of distance and online learning. I say this and often, but Nelson Mandela got his degree from the University of London on a distance programme. We've had the Open University, which has been running for 50 years, delivering programmes via television and radio, and more recently through the online medium. So there is experience to draw on in many institutions. We're adapting the ways of delivering learning, teaching and assessment, and that's been a large factor of what QE has been doing, working with the sector to understand what quality is, how to deliver it, and support the sector in doing this. So you should see on the slide the timeline of when our government went, took us into lockdown on the 16th of March through to initial guidance on the sector, for the sector through to future planning for the coming academic year and years beyond that. And I think there are some key lessons that we need to draw out from that work. One is careful planning. You, you can't simply move provision online if it's going to maintain quality over longer periods of time. It needs to be designed and structured carefully with care, clear communication for our students. In the UK, our quality code is outcomes-based and offers freedom to provide us to adapt approaches with this in mind, but that planning is really important. We need to think about things like accessibility and digital poverty. Not every student has the same technology access or the skills, and we have to consider the diversity of ways that teaching and learning can be delivered and engaged with and involve students in decisions. We've even encountered academic staff who maybe live in areas that don't have great broadband. I know from a conference we held at colleagues in Nigeria were mentioning the challenge of infrastructure for supporting the, the, the facilitation of online learning. Academic integrity is a third big piece that I would draw out. We have to bear in mind the potential vulnerability to misconduct conduct when changing assessment methods, for example, contract cheating and the SMLs. One of the disturbing things in, in the recent period is the SMLs of up there marketing to try and attract students to be drawn into the mistake of, teach, of cheating and paying someone else to write their essays. The main lesson in assessing impact in this context has been about good planning and building a strategy based on the outcomes involving students in discussions and trying to make your approach is as flexible as possible while you learn. And while the transmission, transition to emergency online teaching has been a huge challenge, there are ways in which measure and impact has become easier. For instance, in gathering data through learning analytics and other ways to find out how students are engaged in their learning. And looking forward, if Elena could move to the next slide. Um, we moved out of the emergency transition period and have started to focus on future, bright, future pr proofing guidance. I have had conversations with around 150 vice chancellors and pro vice chancellors and principals and senior leaders about how are they planning for next academic year, what would it look like and what does quality look like. And again there's a range of applications across the areas listed here underpinning them of four guiding principles that we've adopted as a quality body. That any move to on-site activity is safe and secure for staff and students that degree awarding bodies maintain quality and standards in a move to more flexible and blended types of provision, that providers engage with students and staff in planning changes to delivery and the assessment of teaching and learning, and that planning scenarios are flexible and responsive not only to student needs, but the changing patterns of this horrible disease that's been affecting us all. And, and the latest pieces of work, I think, to finish on three areas we've worked on, we found that online, digital, blended, hybrid has meant many different things to different people across institutions and within institutions. So we produced a taxonomy uh, to describe um, a common language for digital approaches to programme delivery to help provide clarity for students. We've also been interested in, I think it was mentioned by Naraman, that in, in the new economy, as the world recovers, there will be a desire and demand, we believe, for people to look for shorter term courses or ways to retrain to go back into the workforce. So we commenced a review of the credit system in England and looking particularly around micro-credentials. And there's a blog on our website by the chair of that group. And lastly, it's really important. This is about students' lives and students' futures. 
So engaging and involving students in discussions with academic staff and how uh, and what, can, like, uh, what goes on in places like examination boards and with external examiners about new approaches and to provide student feedback into all, all those deliberations so they can be part of shaping their own academic future colleagues. I leave that there because I'm conscious we've got a lot, to, a lot to learn today, a lot of other colleagues to listen to and hopefully chance for a very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas, for keeping the time. And next time I meet you physically, I'll give you a prize for that. Thank you so much. Good start. To that point, plenty of key messages for all of us at a very high macro level, which is really, really important. We move now. I know we have some uh, uh, voting now, Elena, correct? Okay, colleagues, you can vote now, which is the most important change in external accreditation procedure that would help universities adapt. More online and distance reviews methods, longer site-based reviews placements, reduce evidence requirement for second and third reviews. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, a very strong message there, Hassan. Oh my God, very, very strong, uh, Mr. D. Did you know the answer or you expected something else? Um, it's what I thought might be said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want to interpret any results there? Uh, well, what, what, one, one of the things we've, thought, we've talked long and hard about this, and I've said it in ENCA meetings in Europe and, 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 and the colleagues, we, we held an international forum with colleagues right across the globe. And, and one of the opportunities this new way of working brings you is, can quality agencies reduce the demands and the, if you like, the burden on institutions? Yeah. And can we reduce our environmental impact by doing much more preparation online? And, uh, and as much as possible evidence gathering before a visit um, and even virtual site visits, because and, and that has a consequence of being easier to speak to people, less travel, less accommodation costs. Um, but sometimes you do need to physically visit as well, because you, some, you, as we used to say, you need to look into the eyes of people and check that they're telling uh, you a good uh, the, tr the truth um, about their provision. But it, it offers great new opportunities to to cut environmental and financial costs. Okay, thank you so much. My, many thanks, Mr. Douglas. Second poll, please, uh, Elena. Okay, colleagues, you can vote now. What the most important advice and guidance or training that QA agencies could provide? Oh, now we have different. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. Okay. You understand the glass? Well, I, th I think that that's, that that's interesting because <laughs> colleagues will probably be well used to designing courses um, and, and you know, but there's still a challenge to adapt it to new ways of delivery. But I think, and I think we've even seen a question around it. The assessment part is, is very, very different. Yeah. Uh, and of course, staff may have um, learned one way and need to, 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 to teach and deliver. There's, there's, there's new opportunities, but big challenges in, and 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 so I think these are these probably fit quite broadly. I would say you have the similar answers you would get here in the UK, and and it it does I think point to 
the importance of external bodies to not only be checking, if you like, undertaking accreditation assurance, but focusing on quality enhancement and helping whole sectors raise their game to, to, to deliver in this new environment, Hassan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Regulus. Much appreciated. Uh, quick to the point and valid answers. Thank you so much. Uh, it sounds like uh, Eurovision some context now. UAE will be calling soon. I'm going to move now to uh, Dr. Susanna uh, from the United Arab Emirates. And uh, we'll start, Elena, with the poll, and then uh, Dr. Susanna will run her own presentation. Uh, if we can start from uh, by the poll from uh, Dr. Susanna. Please, Dr. Susanna, the, the, the floor is yours. The first short floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good day, everybody, good morning. I'm very glad to see you all. Um, thank you, Professor Hassan, for uh, running this very, very interesting session. And thank you, <laughs> Douglas, for initiating all this, you know, provocative, thought provoking yeah, questions <laughs> about quality assurance. To add to the quality assurance dimension, now I would like to link this to the question that you see on your screens. Uh, given the transformation, given the disruptions, I would say that within the transformation, major transformation, we are experiencing a major disruption. I mean, pandemic. And you know, now, what are the, um, per you, what is the definition for quality? So let's see what the audience thinks about the definition of quality and how we can work around this. Elena, please, yeah, we can get the results now. Still, wow, there are two leading ones, the useful purpose, transformation, oh, none of the above, <laughs> scores less, I mean, least of all. Okay, so great. Now that we have the um, idea of what the audience thinks, I would like to further provoke your thinking around quality and quality assurance within the um, transformation and major disruption we're currently experiencing. Let me share my screen, but it seems, it seems like the host disabled screen sharing and I can't share my screen now. Can I share my screen? Anna, no, no, please. Very interesting question, uh, Dr. Susanna. Be believe me, because the definition of quality is always confusing. Sorry, no. What is Susanna, it? Susanna, you can share your screen now. <laughs> oh, okay. Super. Thank you very much. Now, um, I hope you see my screen, right? We can. And you see the full screen, right? Great. So let me start. I mean, I like always to make, uh, you know, when, when it comes to discussing the quality and the definition of quality and what is the most relevant definition of quality at this point, well, I think that um, we'll, we have to, well, it owes to look, we, we just have to look at the history of uh, educational transformations and throughout the history and see where we are. A bit of history, a bit of present, and then a bit of future. So, well, uh, there have been so far three major um, disruptive periods, disrupting periods in the history of education and uh, education technologies starting first introduction of the alphabet, then introduction of mass produced books into education. And then we entered into a major era of transformation, which is e-learning, distant education and mobile de devices. Well, uh, then we have appeared, we have, to, we have turned to be in a fundamentally altered, impossible to predict and rapidly changing lands landscape. And as if it wasn't enough, then the nature decided that, well, we, we have to experience the pandemic, which is the major, you know, disruption that we are currently in. So uh, within the bigger frame of disruptive transformation and challenged by pandemic and lockdown, higher education and its quality assurance relevance is broadly challenged currently. And this is what we all agree on. And that is why we're currently here to discuss it. 
So we all agree on the following statements that higher education is no longer limited to age groups, higher education institutions themselves, because they are like industries coming in to offer the higher education NGOs. Uh, it's not restricted to the time, no longer a restrictive time bound degree surface. So we all want to have individual approach to learning. We, we want to have competency based education. Single modality no longer works. There is a face to face online hybrid and who knows other um, modes will soon also appear then formal education is no longer the only way of education actually as per one study it's only 10 percent of overall education that a human being takes from the formal education the other 90 percent comes from the informal and non-formal education so on top of all now we have covid 19 breaks in to deprive access to higher education to around 40 percent of students globally well, with the move on to the online education, we experience like 60% um, of the students only are able to access education. The other 40 are deprived of it. Of it. Now, with all these developments, with all these, you know, um, trends that we see globally, as quality assurance, are we still relevant? Are the definitions you voted for still relevant? So let's move and um, I would like to brief, uh, briefly bring to you the study which we did as in Kwahe prior to the um, pandemic. Uh, but uh, it will give you a good sense on uh, where we are in general, even without pandemic, whether, whether we are relevant still. So uh, I, this is just a brief um, uh, data that I'm going to share with you, brief findings from in Kwahe global study. Um, and by the way, the Nkwahi Global Study is the first ever global study that was done um, uh, in seven regions of the world. And we, the book will be published by Brills and Sense. Um, like in a couple of months, we, uh, uh, we look forward to the book to come into being and you can purchase that book. But this is the first ever uh, study on internal and external quality assurance throughout the last 30 years and in different regions of the world. So um, just a brief introduction, I mean, brief introduction of the major findings in, ter in terms of relevance. Well, um, as the global study demonstrates, currently majority of systems are not well equ equipped to handle access to quality education, inclusion and promotion of lifelong learning. So still, even without the pandemic, the access was a major issue. And now adding up with the pandemic it like limits for the uh, access of 40 percent of more students into um, education measurement of actual student success we all the quality assurance currently we have it measures everything else that is possible but the core the intended learning outcome achievement and the links with the labor market these are seen still the elements that are being challenged when it comes to recognition of qualification and promotion of student, faculty, and overall talent mobility, this is sort of a gray area that majority of the systems globally are not yet covering. And quality assurance mechanisms are not developed to stimulate development of a knowledge economy. And this is what we have, these are the major um, findings that we came from the uh, global study. Um, um, now, Current approaches to higher education quality assurance, uh, as we have seen, no longer serves the diversity of needs. And there is a major need to reconsider recognition of quality, uh, to reconsider quality assurance to also concentrate on recognition of quality of qualifications, coverage of diversity, diversity of higher education providers, profiles, performance, measurement of learning outcomes, links with the labor market and measurement of employability, relevance of qualifications knowledge development and transfer, access to education, including inclusive education and lifelong learning. On top of all of this, in the era of technological revolution, quality assurance to be able to still remain relevant and useful for the stakeholders needs a major revamp based on the wide and deep use of the innovative technologies. And we all agree that one size fits all no longer works. Now we all voted, predominantly we had votes for fitness for purpose. And this is the globally accepted uh, term for definition for quality assurance. So my question that I want to leave the audience with at the end of my presentation is, 
is fitness for purpose, which is globally recognized in majority of the system, still a relevant definition for quality? Or shall we, given all these transformations and disruptions within the transformations, reconsider the definition of quality and come up with the one that promotes the relevance and recognition of qualifications awarded? With this, I want to leave the audience for thinking and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Susanna. It was amazing, really, really useful, uh, original, different. We learn a lot from it. Uh, two excellent presentations by Mr. Douglas and Dr. Susanna. And they look at the macro level and whether there's still some of the uh, context, if context is different now, whether still the same definition applies. I really like what you presented and it was very, very clear. Uh, I'm sure you will have plenty of questions. Now we're going to move to the Philippines once again. Uh, it does sound like uh, Eurovision Song Context. And Philippines is calling now with Professor uh, Melinda. Uh, we're going to move more now toward uh, maybe uh, micro level. We started with uh, Sir Douglas and Dr. Susanna at the macro level. And I hope that with Professor uh, Melinda and uh, Dr. Deborah will go more into uh, uh, a little gritty, maybe a hands on type of activity. So, Professor Melinda, are you there? Yeah, yes. Um, good day, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Yasan. And uh, good day, everyone. And um, thank you, Clicks, uh, for the invitation. It is a privilege to be part of this uh, esteemed group uh, to discuss the impact of emergency online teaching on the quality of education. Uh, and share my insights and reflections uh, based on what I observe uh, have happened on the ground uh, during this rush to uh, shift to remote instruction. So Elena, can I request you to share my slides? Okay, so, um, okay, so that's it. So um, I, I will also be uh, sharing um, my observations and uh, experiences uh, as um, president of the Asian Association of Open Universities for the term 2017 to 2019. And until now, I also serve as member uh, of its uh, executive committee. So um, of course, we know that no one was spared uh, in this battle against COVID-19 pandemic. We at the education sector were caught unprepared by the sudden need to, sh to close schools. Um, when this happened, our first response was to shift to online learning or what researchers or practitioners in educational technology called emergency remote learning. So the term was defined by the Commonwealth of Learning as an attempt to replicate classroom teaching and learning process uh, in an online mode and which can also be considered a form of distance education given that the students are separated from their teacher and other elements of the teaching um, and learning environment. So the main goal of the sudden shift to online learning was to ensure that learning continues. So uh, next slide, please, Elena. Okay, so um, online, however, as observed um, in the Philippines, in uh, many Asian countries, as the general learning continuity strategy simply won't work given the uneven development of technologies across the various countries, as I've mentioned in Asia, and even across a specific country like the Philippines, where the remote, rural, and resource-poor communities are mostly digitally excluded. Given this situation, other options will have to be considered to deliver learning content, conduct assessment in a process which will still ensure its integrity, as well as providing support system to our learners. This calls for flex flexibility, which would largely depend on the level of modern ICT integration into the teaching and learning process as what is shown here in the flexibility graph. Next slide, please. Okay, so despite the immediacy of the shift to uh, online learning, um, it, it still puts to the forefront the need to examine how quality of education can still be ensured by looking at the various components of the teaching and learning process. At the Asian Association of Open Universities and also in my university, at the University of the Philippines Open University, we look at the quality assurance framework for online instruction, 
we put this in place at AAOU, at UPOU, to guide technology-enhanced and technology-enabled institutions to self-assess. The same framework provided the basis for the institutional accreditation system, which the association had planned to do this year, had COVID-19 did not happen. Among the pillars of the quality assurance framework are first, the teacher credentials, which talk of the teachers, the knowledge about the content, the pedagogical underpinnings in online learning, and the use of technology for teaching and learning. The learning material and how they were developed, including the learning resources, use, and the learning activities. In my university and in some other open universities in Asia, course material development process follows a rigorous review of experts, instructional designer, to ensure the perfect fit of the content and assessment with the learning goals and the multimedia specialist to ensure also that the appropriate medium or format is used to deliver the content for the lesson. The other pillar of quality is in infrastructure. I mean, it has been also shown in the poll earlier um, on how uh, some of our webinar participants look at quality in terms of infrastructure or the technology, which really provides the platform where the academic activities happen. The platform should always be accessible to both the teachers and the students and should have the features to facilitate the different types of interaction deemed essential to facilitate learning. These are learner-learner, learner-teacher, and the learner-content interactions. Basic analytics or learning analytics should also be available to facilitate monitoring of students' progress and participation in various learning activities. Learner support is another pillar of quality, which we also look into and covers the different services that facilitate course completion, like library services and guidance counseling. Learner support also ensures that the student is provided with a sense of community or belongingness to avoid the feeling of isolation, which is most likely to happen in remote learning. Given the different te technologies or the digital tools, our learners may be isolate, isolated, but they can still stay connected. Assessment has become one of the major concerns during the emergency shift to online learning, which is valid, given that it is also a pillar of quality of instruction in online learning. How assessment is done and what platforms are being used for assessment are also indicators of quality. Research is another important component of the QA framework that is its integration into the culture of online teaching and learning. The QA framework also includes other dimensions of quality, like agility or flexibility to respond to disruptions in education, just like the pandemic that we are experiencing now, natural calamities and even political upheavals, equity or inclusions or accessibility, for those who are traditionally excluded or marginalized like the differently abled individuals, as well as being able to provide lifelong learning opportunities for all as embedded in the sustainable development goals. Sustainability is being able to stay relevant amidst changes and disruptions, innovativeness and creativity. So these dimensions, agility or flexibility, equity and sustainability, are also measured across the different pillars of quality in online learning. So we can determine or have a holistic view or perspective about what quality is when we talk of online learning. Next slide, please, Elena. So how has this experience foreseen to contribute to the overall quality of education? The talk of impact directs me to the time beyond COVID-19 pandemic or that process of norming the new normal and which will be the transformation of classroom instruction as a result of us bringing back to the mode of teaching the lessons we learn and insights drawn from this whole experience of emergency online learning. Norming the new normal will probably result to more courses taught in blended mode, more hybrid programs, more use of open educational resources to ensure quality of instructional content, as well as promoting inclusion. The inclusion of the sustainability features that are included in the QA framework as forwarded by the Asian Association of Open Universities and which we all also practice in my university in the Philippines. So these are the components and this is something that we hope to bring back 
to the classroom teaching, the transformation of classroom teaching, so that we can say that this uh, emergency online learning can really have an impact on the quality of education. So uh, this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mann, for a fascinating presentation once again. I can see the logic now from Mr. Douglas talking about planning, and suddenly Dr. Susanna was telling us about it's not really one size fits all, so planning is needed for sure. And then you talk about online education, we're assuming we are living in, a, in an equal world, it's not an uneven uh, world. So you cannot just go and apply the same as online teaching, depending on the context and the yes. level of maturity and development. So I'm really grateful exactly. for the logic and, and uh, how, how things are flowing from one presentation to another. Thank you for keeping up to time. That's why I, I love working with this panel because even during the preparation, it was not that hard and now in running this, this session, it's just it's, it's easy. Uh, please, uh, Elena, we have two uh, polls for uh, Professor Mann. Colleagues who are still there, if you can vote, please. Online learning can provide quality education if designed well. Yes, no, not really sure. <clears throat> Well, this is, this is really interesting. I mean, I'm happy to note that uh, we have this kind of audience who really believe that online learning can also be a quality uh, form of instruction. So um, just a few uh, who answered not really sure. And uh, we hope that uh, towards the end of our panel discussion, uh, those who are not uh, really sure that online learning can be uh, of equal quality uh, or even better than uh, classroom or face-to-face -face instruction will also be convinced uh, that um, we, can, uh, we can have quality online learning. Okay, next uh, poll please, Elena. So 93%, yes, and I hope that, as you say, Professor Mel, by the end of this panel, uh, then they will change, change their minds maybe. Yeah? Online learning is the future of education. <sighs> wow. So, uh, yeah, we are also getting here uh, interesting results uh, and perspective. Um, yeah, so many, many of our webinar participants really believe that uh, we are, uh, the future is here uh, with our online uh, learning. And uh, this is really the future of education. So uh, thank you very much uh, for those who participated in the poll. Thank you very much for expressing your opinion. Um, I'm also happy with the results and the perspectives that you had shared. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mel. Much, much appreciated. And now we move to our last but not least speaker, calling from the United States of America, Dr. Debra. Dr. Deb, are you there? I'm here. Okay, please, so is you. So, uh, Thank you, Professor Hassan I, uh, and uh, Dr. Naramana for the invitation and good evening, good day to everybody who's uh, joined us. Um, uh, Elena, if you would mind sharing my slides. There you go. So while Elena is, is uh, getting that up, I'll say my presentation will be from a different perspective yet. Uh, Quality Matters is an organization uh, that has been specializing in online education for the last 15 years and, um, and uh, the quality of online education. And we really focus at the teaching and learning piece of online education. And our experience has been um, taking uh, what has been happening, what we've learned from working with about 1,300 institutions, uh, mostly in the US, but uh, we have about 90 institutions in 20 different countries. Uh, so uh, what we've learned from the institutions that are, have been 
focused on, at least in certain units within the institution, on online education and what it had happened for them to be able to take what they knew and learned and expand that uh, during COVID. So I have three slides representing three different periods of time. First, um, what was happening um, pre-COVID-19, what happened during that period of time for um, when remote teaching and the emergency switch to, to online and then sort of this post, post COVID, what we look at. So for, for quality matters, um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a framework that we use to think about quality and you will probably notice it's quite similar to the one that Professor Melinda just talked about in terms of we look at the, what we consider the elements of quality for uh, online student experience. And uh, they go from how well you're um, preparing your students for success before they even step into the online classroom. And the, similarly for faculty, preparing faculty and their readiness and, and um, skill set for online delivery. The LMS or the technology, or the technology infrastructure that you have. Um, institutional infrastructure, which is a big umbrella term to really mean all of the, the student supports and academic supports and uh, um, uh, all proctoring supports and everything that you would, uh, you, your practices and your policies around all of these, are they supporting the online learner? Uh, the course tent content, which has been largely the purview of faculty, of the instructor, um, course delivery and course design. So how well the course is being taught and how well the course is designed to be taught. So in the earlier days, uh, we focused, we started out focusing on the course design piece because in the on fully online students, that's how they're experiencing the institution. It's mediating their um, interaction with the instructors and so it was really important for us to focus on course design and at the time it, there was a gap there. So we consider quality course design as something that requires foresight and planning to create uh, the learning environments and experience for student success. So we have standards around this, there are uh, 42 standards and uh, broken into eight areas of uh, general areas of quality, one of which is about assessment. I saw that lots of you had questions about assessment, um, but, it, but uh, it is a way to think about quality in online education. And for those institutions that were uh, doing this work, and typically not throughout the, the institution, maybe not a fully online institution, but within departments or colleges within an institution, uh, they would attempt to apply the standards and some of them would do it formally and, and have their courses reviewed by us in a formal peer review process using review, reviewers that are a faculty. Um, and then others would do this internally. And so before COVID hit, we had certified, reviewed and certified 10,000 courses and many, many more were being handled internally in the institution, applying quality standards. Um, and uh, that had been our focus. Well then, uh, Elena, if you would go to the next slide, please. So what happened in the spring of 2020 was the community, uh, the educational community that had been uh, working at their campuses to improve the quality of their online education had to immediately stop and help the entire university move their courses from the face-to-face -face classroom to the online to online delivery and what that really meant because the time frame was so short within generally within two weeks they had to get the entire university's curriculum online and so that really meant they had to leave behind uh, a lot of the things they would normally build into a course for quality. They did not have time. So the focus was on simply continuity of education to allow the students to be able to continue their study and to do that uh, in as efficient a way as possible. Well, what that meant was for this remote teaching period, 
the focus was on transfer of the content um, and keeping the students on a schedule with synchronous delivery. Um, but there was very limited instructor training because obviously there wasn't the time for it. Um, there were, as it turns out, many access and equity issues for students who were not prepared to be, to be able We lost the voice, I think. Sound is okay. Dr. Debra. Can you hear me? Anybody can hear me? Can you hear me, Elena? I can hear you. I can hear you. I think you can get this. Dr. Debra, I think we can't How do we address those? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear are you. you. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me now? Okay. So I'm not sure where that cut out. Sorry about that. Um, uh, at any rate, there were uh, um, issues uh, for access for students um, and for remote work issues for faculty, staff, and students. Um, mental, emotional, physical health issues that were arising uh, largely as a result of, of COVID-19 and the disease, but had to be handled within the context of, of uh, the, the educational delivery. And then many, many assessment issues. What we found was um, many institutions that were doing online education had a external online proctoring going on for their students. And they did not have a, the budget to extend that to every student when everybody moved online. And, and the alternative to doing uh, proctoring, which does obviously does not work for all students anyway, uh, is to redesign the assessment so that you have authentic assessments. And there was no time to do that during the remote teaching. And so one of the things that we did, and I don't see that link on the slide, maybe because I'm not uh, in full screen here. Um, let's see. Uh, it's kind of, I don't know if you can see it at the very bottom of the slide. One of the things that we did during this time is to create a, a remote emergency sec checklist that we tried to set out as broadly as possible to the entire community, not just the QM community, but to anybody to think about what are the, what are the quality factors that you can consider even during this very rapid switch to online? What are the things that an instructor could actually do to make their, their course even marginally better as they move that to online? And so we created that as derivative from, you know, the, the, uh, the final quality standards and tried to communicate that out. And I put that link here um, uh, for anybody who would like to go and see that. So the next slide, please, uh, Elena. Next slide, Elena. There we go. Oh, no, that's the same one. Elena, can you hear that? Oh, no. no, that's the first one. The first yes. one. Yes, I hear, but it is not moving. I am sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Styled maybe after a long. Just, uh, yeah, I will stop sharing and we'll start again. Okay, no problem. Thank you. If time. we need, okay. If it if we need to, I could share my screen as well. If it won't go, we'll try. Okay. I think that Dr. Deb, if you have the presentation, uh, if it's not going to work now, it's better you share it. Work maybe now, that's it. Yeah. This is your slide. Okay. Let's see here. Just a second. All right, so that's the last slide. What's the slide right before that? 
that's it. We're here. <laughs> oh, wait, that's, there we go. Sorry about that. I had mine up too. So this last piece is really about uh, how do we move forward from here, looking towards uh, the fall semester and beyond? How do we build on what we learned during the COVID period of time? So uh, the, key, the key thing really is what happened during this remote teaching period is not quality online education. And we've been trying to be clear about that. So we've been trying to talk to folks about how to move forward from that. We've learned a lot from that period of time. And uh, one of the things that we want, that institutions are looking to do and need to look to do if we're online again in the fall is to ensure students are prepared and supported to learn online. So that means changes to that quality pie um, framework for institutions to think about, do they have adequate infrastructure to support students? Are the, uh, the academic supports um, in the system in which it's delivered helpful to the online learner? Uh, the same thing with the technologies that are provided and, and to ensure that students have access to those, to the appropriate technology that they need and the policies around that. Um, training, ensuring faculty are prepared to teach online. And one of the earlier polls, I noted that that was one of the, the leading responses as to what's really needed now. And that's what we're seeing as an organization uh, across the US at least. Um, there is a heavy, heavy movement right now. I would say a groundswell movement to help provide training for faculty about how to do this well online. And so, uh, that's largely about training, but it's also about providing tools and resources and communication. This is really tough because, uh, because being online raises a lot of um, issues that traditional faculty aren't necessarily prepared to think about. And for example, uh, student privacy issues and, and uh, student data privacy issues. What happens when faculty are finding tools outside the uh, the LMS, some apps and different things to engage students in, but uh, it, it uh, exposes students and students' data to, um, to abuse and manipulation. So these are things, these are new policies that the institutions have to grab, grab hold of. And the final thing is really um, reimagining the face-to-face -face curriculum. It's not about creating the exact experience online as they had in the classroom. It's about reimagining the curriculum and preparing online courses that are fully developed to meet quality standards. That's a longer term process. It's not gonna be done in two weeks, um, but I can, we can see that effort is happening now. And as a baseline, regardless of what happens in the future, Having that, having the courses created that way allows for the flexibility that you heard in the other presentations about being blended and, hi and hybrid learning and being able to be, um, you know, digitally enhanced on campus teaching if necessary. So this is really the, f the, the, the path forward, whether online learning is the, the future or not, uh, it's certainly going to be a foundational piece of it. So I think I'll stop there and thank should we you. ask for the poll? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobra. It's a really useful presentation. And uh, once again, it moves all the way from well, planning foresight into the implementation, which I really like. It brings everything together. Now for the poll, please. First poll for uh, Dr. Dobra. Uh, overall, how manageable was it the move to remote instruction at your institution? We asked this question in an annual survey that we do uh, with uh, our partner Edge of Ventures, which is a, a research and consulting organization. We collaborate on an annual survey in the U.S. of chief online officers. So I can compare the responses here to those. Very challenging. Hmm. So we have move that over here. 
So uh, it, it's interesting. So 50% found it very challenging um, and then somewhat difficult and uh, only 21% smooth and straightforward. So um, Interesting. Nobody so, said not applicable. So everybody is doing it. Everybody's, everybody's in the same situation. <laughs> and uh, I will say the, the, um, the respondents to the study that we did are chief online officers. So these are people who have, who are at institutions who at least have been focused on that piece of it. And still there were um, uh, 90, only 19% of that population said that pivot was smooth and straightforward. 44% said it was somewhat difficult and 36% said it's challenging. So this was something that I think was impossible to be prepared for. Okay. So uh, the next poll, please. Poll, please. Okay, Elena, we can stop. We can, I want to move. We still have 20 minutes for questions. I want to make sure that we're benefiting from the time for questions. Okay. okay. I, I, I'll just make the one, one comment that clearly all of the above was important. Um, and that's pretty much what we saw as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Uh -huh. Really good. Uh, we have uh, really uh, a full fantastic presentation. We enjoy every single one of them. Learn a lot from all of you. Uh, we have now time about 20 minutes for uh, questions uh, from the audience. I'm not gonna ask any of the questions, I'm gonna rely on the audience, but a lot of people ask about maybe the integrity of assessment, uh, especially the assessment of labs, and uh, one particular person addressed it to Dr. Sudan, but I want everybody maybe to, uh, uh, to answer this question. Is the, is the integrity of online assessment and the assessment of practical or lab-based subjects, to what extent we can ensure that quality standards are met. Please, if we start with Dr. Debra, let's start from uh, that side this time. Okay, so this is a, this, this has been an issue, this is an issue everywhere. Um, and one of the things that we have been recommending is that to rethink how you are assessing students. And so whether or not do you really have to assess them with a, with a, um, with a test um, and whether you have to assess them with an, the, an essay, a generic, an essay that's similar to the essay that you ask all students to write in every course period. Can you design an assessment that's more authentic to what it is they're supposed to know? and do, be able to do when they're finished with their course. And so that you can evaluate what, whether they're actually, how well they're actually demonstrating that uh, in a realistic way, rather than through an exam, an examination of knowledge. Um, because those would be, those are harder to ensure academic integrity. Those require different kinds of um, proctoring that, that are not, um, effective for students who, who uh, don't have stable internet connections. And um, but even at, even at institutions like Georgia Tech, online proctoring is a problem for some of their students. So uh, finding different ways to do that would be our recommendation. The universal, the universal problem, for sure. Uh, Dr. Susanna, please, what's your experience? Dr. Susanna? Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, just a moment. Yeah, I mean, um, assessment of students has been even a challenge even before the pandemic, <laughs> and especially when it comes to assessment of actual, actual measurement of achievement. So have the tests been able to measure actually what we were supposed to measure? That was even a problem before, let alone now when we have moved on to online mode 
in the online mode, the, the whole issue is about the technology on how to make sure they authenticate, how to make sure there is an integrity, I mean, integrity is in place. There are other, all other issues involved, uh, starting from authentication and integrity and everything else. But the content itself, the measurement methodology itself is challenged. Whatever you put it in an online mode or in the technology, the methodology itself is challenged. We we'll all agree that big tests fail big time. We we'll all agree that in majority of cases, SS don't even help. So it's really very important to rethink the methodology of assessment itself and try to um, measure, I mean, um, in, uh, in all the measurements, try to put the relevance elements in it. So make it relevant. I mean, I, I didn't uh, talk about relevance, I mean, without any purpose in mind. I, I did talk about relevance on purpose because we talk, whatever we do, all our offers at higher education level, starting from the learning outcome, starting and ending from with the assessment of learning outcomes and achievement of the learning outcomes, the relevance matters more. And currently we see that, and COVID and basically pandemic showed that we all are um, um, very poorly equipped when it comes to measuring the achievement of the learning outcomes. And not only with the technology, but also with the methodology as well. So I think that uh, there needs to rethink and revamp the whole idea of um, assessment and assessment at different level, whether this is diagnostic, summative, or, you know, any type of, um, uh, uh, you know, assessment needs to be revised okay. and put in place. Thank you, Dr. Susanna. I'm, I'm going to take another question, maybe. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Douglas and Professor Mel, you spoke about uh, planning and the transition. And there's a question here about what should a young university, I don't want to say a young university, any university, will do uh, to smoothen the transition from traditional uh, to distance learning. So when you were talking about planning, planning in what way? How, what, what are the essential steps? I start with Mr. Douglas, then move to Professor Mann. Mr. Douglas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. It doesn't matter whether you, you're very young or very old. If, if it's a completely radical transformation of your approach, you need to organize and plan that. And, and, and what do we, I think Melinda and I are probably saying very similar things, but on the ground, Melinda's much more directly involved. Yes. You, you have to start out, what, what is this program? What is it for? How, how, how are we going to deliver this? How are we going to go engage students in their own learning? How are we going to provide the resources they need? Um, so we've had issues here in the UK, both in schools and in universities, providing laptops or 4G connection cards, a, a, a whole range of things around. The, the way you would design any course, all of the the same things come into play, but being done in a different manner and through to through to assessment. And I think you know there's it, been picked up a, a couple of times. We have made fairly radical shifts in the UK to describing our national frameworks in terms of outcomes for students, and that fits, I guess, with a lot with the European approaches of shift to student-centred learning. Uh, and and if you operate from that basis, and you operate in a, in a perspective of how will these students engage in it? How can we help them learn? And how can we assess the outcomes at the end? It's, 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 it, it's, not, it's not that difficult um, if you sit back in the way you would plan anything else. One of the things, I, I have posted a lot of links, and I'm sorry about that, but the guidance that we produce, it's, it's been done all with practitioners in the UK. So in every one of these sets of guidance, you've got reflective questions. It's all about enhancement and quality enhancement. And please, they're, they're free to use for anybody. I mean, we've published practice from all across the world. Have a look at them and, and take yourselves through those types of questions. Uh, we hope that it's, it's there for the whole of the higher education community, not just in the UK. Thank you, Mr. That's very, very useful. Professor Mann? Yes, uh, based on the, my uh, observation on what happened here in the Philippines, I think uh, when you start uh, planning for this uh, transition, uh, whatever uh, the, the, the status of your university or your school, you have to think of your bottom lines. What are your bottom lines? So first of course, is the protection. Protection of our students, uh, protection of our teachers and the other employees of our university. 
the second bottom line is that we will ensure that learning should continue. It's not just teaching that should continue, it's learning uh, which should continue. Therefore, we have to know the context of our students. So in, in most cases, they are all, all thinking, is my university connected? The question should be, is my, are my students connected? So if they are connected, then I can probably have the, the online learning. But what if they are not connected? What kind of distance education model uh, can I implement given the context of my university and the context of my students? What are the learning goals that I need to, uh, to look into, that I need to consider when I do the planning, when I uh, develop my materials, when I design um, the learning activities? So we always have to go back to the minimum or the basic learning goals that our uh, learners should accomplish so that wherever they have access to the internet or not, whether they will just be using the printed materials or they will just be, they will be using uh, the um, internet resources the minimum learning goals should be achieved by our students, whatever their context is. So again, the bottom line, our bottom line should always be considered when we start planning uh, for, uh, like, uh, for the next opening of classes, um, what kind of delivery, learning delivery um, model uh, will we adopt? Um, so that, that will always be the start because that will also determine what kind of training you will give to the faculty, to the staff of your university, and what kind of preparation you will have to give to the students of your school. So, uh, so I always go back to the most basic questions when, when we start planning and when we talk of planning for our schools. Thank you, Professor Mel, very useful. Now, uh, I want to ask this question from, from the audience as well to all the panelists, in fact, and it's all about change. I mean, we all know that we are resistant to change. We don't like change. But this time, we have no option but to change. But the question from the audience was, what sort of incentives may help higher education institutions, universities, become more agile, lean, flexible, in order to lead disruptive changes? Yeah. What incentives shall we put in place for these institutions? I start with Professor Mel, as you are there. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, in terms of incentives, I, I guess uh, there is already that realization that uh, we, we don't have any choice. I mean, if we, if we want to stay um, in this um, uh, profession of teaching, then we don't have any choice but to change. But in terms of incentive, we also need to look at what are the enabling uh, policy environment? What, what are the policies that we can put in place uh, so that we can really motivate um, our teachers, the staff of the university, of the school to participate in the change process? So, uh, and what are the barriers that are preventing them uh, to participate? in this uh, shift to this uh, mode of instructional delivery. So when we look at the barriers and when, when, when we um, also check um, the various concerns that they are facing, that, then that's probably one motivation because the motivation, the lack of motivation can probably be due to some barriers that they are experiencing. In our case, we, we also try to give some incentives in terms of work credit or work um, deloading so that they can focus, the teachers, I mean, can focus on training and in redesigning their courses because the, the, the major task now is in terms of redesigning the courses. They have the course syllabi, but they need to redesign it for this mode of instructional delivery. So uh, incentives, not necessarily in terms of monetary, but probably in terms of work credit. But if the university can afford it, if the government can afford it, especially for government funded um, institutions or um, universities, then probably some form of um, uh, financial assistance to so the teachers who will be doing the extra work uh, can also be provided. But we can think of many other incentives uh, that the teacher will appreciate in doing this. Thank you, yeah. Professor Mel. Let's leave some to our other colleagues. Maybe Dr. Susanna, please. What sort of incentives should we put in place? I would say that this is a very, you know, complex question <laughs> which involves a lot of factors in it. And it merits a separate session and a separate discussion <laughs> on its own. The incentives could vary from like starting from legal and regulatory underpinnings from the autonomy level of the institutions, from the academic freedom, up to academic freedom of the faculty members, of the freedom of the students to do things. I mean, so many factors are involved in it. But, um, well, I would just briefly say that, well, this is the, the change 
change agent itself, like who should be the change agent, the student and the faculty. So this is what we have to start from. And this is the key. Unless they are convinced in the necessity of the change, they will never change. So this is the whole purpose is to have them buy in into this change. Good point. Good point. Never, never expect anybody to engage in anything that serves your values unless you give them the adequate reasons to do so. <laughs> this is the quote from my professor, Professor Dwyer from US. And I think that this is the major driver of change in itself. You have to have the buy-in from the change agent themselves. Otherwise, this is not going to work. But the factors are diverse and complex, and it merits a totally different level of discussion. At least, I'm, maybe I'm going to move to uh, uh, Dr. Debra and uh, Mr. Douglas to another question, which is what's was with by the audience, is about cost cutting. Uh, the pressure on, on cost and the rest and quality could suffer uh, because of uh, reduction in investment or whatever. Uh, to what extent this is true that uh, any cost cutting activities could lead to a reduction in quality? Uh, Dr. Debra and then Mr. Douglas, please, if you can speak for one minute each because I still have four minutes to conclude. Dr. Debra. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll try to be quick here. I just want to say on the previous question, I, the, the, the uh, pressures for change existed in the US in a serious way before COVID to yeah. be innovative. And, and there were pressures for that and uh, incentives already being discussed. Uh, in terms of cost, um, I have to echo Susanna, this is a complex question. <laughs> Uh, about how do you how do you mitigate that? Um, and I think what we're seeing right now in the U.S. is there's uh, they're thinning out, becoming leaner, laying off staff, and unless things are done correctly, it will have implications for quality. I I don't know how to sugarcoat that. <laughs> you have you have decisions to make, right? And where you're going to invest, what little resources you do, and you need to be very thoughtful about how to to make sure that you're moving forward correctly. Thank you, Dr. Debra. And uh, Mr. Douglas, please, one minute. Sure, and, and, and I think what's happened, just to take one, the last question into this one, is the incentive for change has been a global pandemic. Uh, and that has been a big, the, the innovation we're seeing, the acceleration of the pace of change. One institution I've worked with over some work on the future of digital assessment has said that all of the reservations that people had to move into online assessment have gone. Um, whole departments and universities that had resisted change have suddenly realised they needed to change because one about the safety of the students and the safety of the staff, but also the world has changed dramatically and this virus is going to be with us for a while. Um, I, 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 and in terms of, look, there comes a point where you can only cut so far and quality is seriously affected. You can become a more efficient in any organisation. You can find different ways of delivering. Although I don't believe online is necessarily cheaper. I think there's lots of investment that's got to go on in getting a program uh, running properly. I, and I think it's inevitable. Some institutions will be harder hit than others. Um, if enrollments fall, if global student mobility slows down, uh, there will be short term financial shocks. I think we'll see the potential for some realignment, um, maybe dropping of some programs. Uh, we, we're hearing a lot of optional modules being dropped um, and sticking to a core uh, and inevitably I think some academic staff may suffer but out of this as well I think new and innovative providers will grow and there'll be opportunities for people to engage in that as well. Thank you, thank you Mr Douglas, fantastic answer, a fantastic panel discussion, unfortunately the, the time has come to an end, I see Dr Larry Mann on the screen now uh, but I would like to uh, thank the panelists. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to, to thank the audience for attending and for the brilliant questions. We still have plenty, unfortunately, we don't have time to answer them. Uh, but the panelists were just amazing. Uh, Mr. Douglas, uh, we learned a lot from you about the importance of planning and uh, uh, look at macro level in terms of the transition from uh, uh, traditional to online teaching. Uh, Dr. Susanna, your presentation was really excellent. Uh, it's all about relevance and uh, fitness of purpose and transformation. The rest, in terms of definition of quality, 
and not one size fits all, which is absolutely true because it all depends on the context. And, and this is once again related to what Professor Mel said about the, the online teaching. It cannot be the same everywhere and to say it's impossible because the level of maturity, the level of development is, is different. And then of course, Dr. Deborah who brought everything together from planning and foresight. I really like the word foresight. And this is what we should be spending more time in our in the education sector to look at foresight, futurology, future studies, scenario planning. And we haven't done much in, in that area. It's really important because we were taken by uh, surprise uh, by uh, COVID-19. Uh, it was an amazing panel. I'm really grateful to all of you uh, for working with you over the last few weeks. Uh, this was an easy panel, I can assure you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Nariman, for being a great leader. Uh, you know how much I respect you. I respect Dix for what you are doing. Your work is transformation. I have no question about it. And I don't want anything from you. I just want to say the truth and speak up my mind and my conscience is clear that what Dix has done, I know even before COVID-19 was unbelievable. So I'm really grateful for giving us the opportunity to be together with my esteemed colleagues. And many, many thanks to Elena for helping us with the logistics. And you have done a fantastic job, Elena, like last time, we're in, in Dubai in March. And uh, many thanks to our sponsor. Now I will leave it to uh, uh, Dr. Nariman for the last uh, maybe few seconds of this panel discussion. Many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Ghassan. And I just wanted to uh, also thank our wonderful audience. I know there have been lots of questions that we haven't had the chance to answer, but during the summertime, we will start uh, a series of interviews with an expert on our Voice of Higher Education group. So uh, hopefully you'll have more time to ask one-to-one -one questions. And uh, I wanted to thank Professor Ghassan for never turning me uh, uh, down and always, you know, being willing to support with all my guidelines and all my requirements and all. So thank you very much, Professor Ghassan. And thank you very much to my esteemed colleagues who on the panel, Professor Melinda, Dr. Debra, Ms. Douglas, Dr. Susanna. I'm really grateful that, you know, without any hesitation, despite your busy schedules, you've uh, responded to our, uh, uh, to our invitation. Thank you to everyone and see you next Monday, same time for the last uh, a series or the last panel of the In Conversation with Clicks for this academic year. Stay safe and see you soon, inshallah. Ma see you soon, inshallah. Bye. Bye. Wonderful chairman. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. We'll send you the oh, check. Nice. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Good bye, -bye. Job. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye. 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 Speak bye. to you soon. Congratulations for the wonderful session. Thank you.